I'm Barry Cassidy, and you're not. 24 away from 10. Yes, indeed, it is Outsiders time this week. We bring to you, for your listening enjoyment, writer and social commentator Eva Cox, marketing guru, ad man, and author of the recently published Ballots, Bullets and Bullshit, now available in shops, Toby Ralph, and features director for L Australia, Alex Gorman. Welcome to you all. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. I, I, I want to start with this, and, it, and it's a, a strange and, and very vexing subject. It's the Luke Batty killing and the, the media coverage that surrounded it. Am I the only person, when a story like that breaks, when we have such an absolutely horrendous event uh, covered in such detail, am I the only person who recoils a little from that coverage, Toby? Uh, no, I'm, I join you. It's horrible, isn't it? I mean, commercial media treads such a fine line. Um, it imagines itself to be this honourable bearer of truth, but of course it's flogging product. And the scary thing about fulfilling product needs and wants of your customers is what customers want and need. And yet in this instance, Eva, that coverage, which, which would have gone its predictable way, was saved by the extraordinary courage of Luke's mother. It was. And I mean, I watched her, and I mean, it actually made me feel sick the way the media was sort of pushing it, because I thought she desperately needed to be left alone in an extraordinarily difficult situation. She had her say, and then everybody went around poking around, had they arrested him, had the police system worked. This was about violence, this is this, you know, and it sort of blew out to the stage where everywhere you were, it was there. I mean, it was a huge tragedy. Whether it was avoidable, we don't know. But the level of dealing, I don't think, I, I don't know whether I agree with Toby, I'm not sure people actually wanted to read as much of that stuff as they actually got. I think actually if you'd have asked readers, a lot of them would have felt like us, that it was over the top, it was ugly, yeah. and it sort of played into the idea that people want that sort of violence. But I suspect if you talk to some of the readers, you know, as a researcher, that a lot of them actually would have felt very much the way we did. I don't know. If but, but okay. Alex, Alex has got his. Yes. I think, Eva, that you're right in many cases. However, there's also a pretty solid piece of evidence that people are enormously interested in this case, which is the 158,000 likes that RIP Luke Batty has on Facebook. So when you have this clear sort of social media message that people are really interested in this case, even if it's not necessarily in our best interest to look very closely, you can see why as a news producer you would feel that you should do more coverage. Sure. It's an interesting question whether likes on a Facebook page about a tragedy translate into wanting to read incessant details about something in a way that doesn't actually do that. I think, I think people felt a huge uprush of, that, of emotion about the thing, but I'm not sure that they needed to be given all the details. And in fact, she went to a magistrate eventually mm. to sort of suppress some Indeed. of the details. And, and, and Toby, that, that's an interesting thing, because as much as uh, the mother was, was composed and, and made great sense and made strong points, he was still a woman who, less than 24 hours before that first media conference in which she was so impressive, had stood by while this man had clubbed her son to death with a cricket bat and stabbed him, mm. and then watched that man's killing as well. That is, uh, by definition, unspeakably traumatising. That is a person in profound shock who then fronts a media pack and whose words are then transmitted to us all in, in our thousands. Is that process right? Um, probably. It, it's appalling, but it's probably right. Um, at, the end, at the end of it, I think the media do have a job to do, do have to get to the truth, do have to tell us what's going on, no matter how horrid it is. And their stock in trade is, of course, tragedy and ghastly events and human misery and and they and they see themselves digging for it and there's a there's a ready audience for it so it's been a bizarre thing in in so many ways is that and so she seemed so bravely prepared to um uh, pander to that and i wonder alex if if, if she's a to some extent a, a product of the um 
the subconscious media training we all receive in this this time in which we live that she knew how to take that moment knew how to seize that opportunity despite her circumstances and do something positive with it that the media had no intention of necessarily doing something positive that was entirely in her hands mm. Look, I think she showed an amazing courage under pressure, and I think that she did something that is incredibly commendable, which is move from this absolute horror, the horror that's emerged from this, to a wider conversation about the more mundane horrors that women are facing every day, that children are facing every day, with family violence and with our failing mental health system, and I think she should be commended for that. Australia actually does have a really wonderful history mm. of turning a horrific event into action. Just look at the gun control laws that we passed after the Port Arthur massacre, and I can only hope that in this instance we do take another look at our mental health care system and do look at the ways in which it's failed and try and address that. It's a complicated problem, but I hope that this is a push towards helping the thousands of Australians who are suffering from untreated mental illness. A key word that, that Alex uses there, Eva, was, was mundane, I think, that, that the things of almost equal horror happen reasonably routinely, but not in that sort of public space and not with that sort of subsequent public glare. How do we give them the, the importance they deserve? I think, as has been said, that the mother was extraordinarily brave. I think what she said and how she dealt with it and her objection to actually trashing what her ex-partner had done of saying, you know, that he really did love the boy and he was mad, I think that was incredibly useful as a way of trying to solve this problem. The problem I had was some of the coverage seemed to be almost sort of vengefully going after that particular thing about sort of, you know, lock up the maddie, you still this sort of stuff, rather than looking at the services, looking at the problems. And that's where I think <coughs> it started getting tacky, and that's where I think the media sort of overreached and, and lacked any sense of judgment about what people wanted. And I think that stuff becomes fairly scary when you start going on witch hunts after who's to blame, rather than how you change the system to make sure it doesn't happen again. And maybe, maybe, Toby, that the, the likes that Alex mentions on, on Facebook and so on, the, the, the attention, I, I wonder how often it translates into the actual sort of political movement, into political capital that can be used to actually change the circumstance. These things kind of live there, but don't translate to this other place over there where something might come of it. They can be for a very short time, but, you know, Twitter outrage lasts 12 hours and Facebook likes last three hours um, people just they, political action requires something far more solid than a, the press of a button um, what she said as a mother um, will probably stimulate some very real change and have the opportunity for for a fundamental examination of uh, the problem of you know mental health in the country i suspect there will be political outcomes but i don't think it's going to flow from facebook time will tell it's coming up to a quarter to ten this is outsiders on sunday extra and this morning they are you just heard the mellifluous tones of toby ralph alex gorman and eva cox join you as well and here's a bit of this week's politics my questions to the Prime Minister. Yesterday afternoon, 1,300 West Australian workers lost their jobs at Forge Mining Services. These job losses come on top of the worst unemployment figures this nation has seen in a decade. In fact, the worst figures since the Prime Minister was Minister for Employment. When will the Prime Minister start fighting for Australian jobs? Well, the best thing we can do for the businesses that the workers of Forge depend on for their jobs is to unshackle them by repealing the carbon tax, repealing the mining tax. And I say to the Leader of the Opposition, if you are serious, if you are fair to him uh, about this, get out of the way and let the cure be put in place. You know, Eva Cox, it doesn't have a point. I mean, we, we, we have here a government which has a particular view of how it wants to go about uh, restoring activity and therefore jobs growth to the economy, we have a, an opposition which appears uh, bent on frustrating that. Is that a reasonable circumstance? 
Well, if we knew that actually doing the things that the government said they were going to do was going to stimulate a dying manufacturing industry, we might actually sort of be some point to it. But I think what you've got, unfortunately, is two political parties playing political games with a particular issue, which is a much broader issue. I mean, manufacturing has been going backwards for a very long time. Unemployment rates have been going up. I mean, if they're serious about worrying about the unemployed, maybe they should actually add some money to New Start so that people are not so scared of losing their jobs. That might be a help. That that old chestnut either. That old chestnut, which still has not been sold. No. But I mean, the point about it is, if you look at countries like Sweden and so on, where they actually have a reasonable unemployment benefit, people are not scared to move from one industry to another. But it's very fearful here because we treated the unemployed so badly. And then all of a sudden we get terribly upset about potentially unemployed blue-collar male workers. And we tend to ignore the fact that manufacturing, if you look at the statistics, has been going out, and we need to be able to think smarter. And actually, abolishing the carbon tax is not about thinking smarter. You might save a few marginal businesses, but I mean, the idea that it's going to make such a difference to something that's been going out backwards for a solidly long time is actually, I think, quite false. And, and yet, Toby, the, 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 the sort of the, the King Car response to these situations of, of throwing public money at it isn't actually uh, a plan either. No, I, I mean, manufacturing stuffed. Yeah, that's completely right. It's gone from 25% of the economy down to nearly 7% and it's going to keep on falling. Why? Um, because a quarter of the stuff that gets made in the world is exported and that's going to climb to 70%. You've got a global workforce with an average in uh, income of 100 bucks a month. If you're in the top 10%, you're getting 1,000 bucks a month. A lot of people here are earning 70 grand and that puts them in, in the one in a thousand elite of the world. When you can take that job and give it to someone in China or India, as will increasingly happen, um, those people are going to suffer terribly. We, you know, the, the third world is still a place at the moment, but I think in a couple of decades we're going to globalise that. We're going to import the third world. And, uh, and there are going to be upsides to globalisation too, right, and lifting people out of poverty. But, but um, it is inevitable that unskilled work within Australia is going to um, be hollowed out. And Alex Gorman, I mean, do, do you get the sense from the, the, the tone of the political discussion around this, around what's well, a really serious issue, as, as Toby sort of spells out there in some points, things are dramatically changing in our economy and in the way it intersects with the world. Are we kind of getting uh, a debate through, give us your plan, notice, you know, you're frustrating our plan, get out of the way, give us another plan. Is, it, I mean, is that really coming to grips with it? I think it's um, a fallacy to assume that anything that uh, any government in power can do will have that much of an impact on the state of the Australian economy. I think unless the coalition has a magic wand that can affect global commodity prices, say, we're not necessarily going to see policies from either side of the spectrum affecting the economy in the huge way that one might hope for. And I think that people don't necessarily want to admit that truth, that it is more about chance and the global winds of change than it is about any specific policy that the Australian government can put in place. But, and but I think from, that, from that point, doesn't the government, though, it has a certain amount that it has to administer? I mean, as the IMF points out this week to the Australian government what you're doing is the right thing is to getting the budget towards some sort of a balance and doing all those things shouldn't the government in that sort of public administration sense be just allowed to get on with that job as it sees fit I think that the government is trying to get on with um, the job as they say see fit but whether or not that's the right way of approaching it or whether or not that's going to have the effect that they desire is something that we still need to have a conversation about and I'm not sure that their strategies are going to be effective. Didn't we, Eva yeah. Cox, have that, that conversation late in September last year? <laughs> we keep having this conversation. I mean, the point about it is we need to restructure the economy. We have, need to move to being a service economy because that's one of the things we still have the skills which are not so easily exportable. We need to actually have a look at innovative type stuff. We need to encourage small business. We need to put more money into universities so that we've got research, so that we've actually got training, so we've got all of those things. That's the sort of plan we should have, not shoveling big lumps of money into sort of into industries that we know are going to go offshore and don't belong here in many cases anyhow. I think that's where 
both sides of politics are so keen to actually, I mean, the government is still behaving like the opposition because they're still carrying on about getting rid of Labour policies and putting in their own. And I think that the, uh, you know, that the, uh, the opposition is sort of still trying to hang on to an image and, and the blue-collar workers and ignoring the fact that even in the union movement, most of the uh, workers there are white-collar and female, which seems to be completely ignored in this how, how, how Toby Ralph should the government pitch this? How should it pitch this moment to us? How should it convince us of the need of, of big change? Well, the, the trouble is you can't put it in three words. Um, it's a really complex... Stop the jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Yeah, that's right. The, uh, they're doing that. They're definitely doing that. The, uh, it, it's very, very hard to develop this as a narrative. Um, and they've got some time to do it. They can do it over the next year because they've just been voted in. Um, but to make people understand what's going on with globalisation, to make people understand our place in the world, how we need to change to be more competitive, and why it's um, wrong to prop up failing um, manufacturing operations, although it's great for the workers in the short term, it's, it's bad for them in the long term. Those are complicated stories, and, um, they, and they're not going to be reduced to a glib slope slogan, unfortunately. Which is where we sort of have a bit of a separation, isn't it, Alex? Because we, we sort of have a politics of slogans from both sides. A politics of slogans in, in a time of great complexity. Yes, and I think it's very difficult to go from having this sort of soundbite culture to moving into being able to make the kind of nuanced, complex arguments that are required to explain how fiscal policy in this country should work. And I think that both parties are going to really need to work on the way that they have gotten used to communicating with the Australian public and perhaps give us a little bit more credit for our ability to understand complex problems and present them in a complex way. A, a tough part of which, Eva, and, and just to, on a final point probably mm. here, it is convincing us of the necessity of probably giving them more of our money. Well, I think that's probably something people underestimate. I mean, when you look at the taxation polls, people are actually prepared to pay more tax if they know the government will do the right thing, which is why so-called hypothecated taxes, mm. like we've got coming up for the NDIS, are actually quite popular. So in a sense, the public is not as anti as the government thinks it is. And the government needs to stop, and the opposition need to stop, assuming that you use things, uh, you know, that you use research to tell you what the policies are rather than how to sell them. I mean, that's a major error that keep making. But I think that, you know, treating the Australian voters, though they're sort of stupid punters and self-interested in the entire thing, actually demeans the role of government and it creates a level of cynicism about the role of government. And it does in feed into that sort of three-word slogan type stuff and the, and the social media type stuff, where people are capable of thinking and are actually, if you appeal to them, as sensible, reasonable human beings who have a social conscience and care about the world that they live in, instead of being economic, self-interested little deadsheds, then you <laughs> might actually get voters just thinking a little bit more about the fact that maybe we should contribute more to the public pool. <laughs> Toby, Toby, a three-word uh, three slogan to, to encourage a, a more reasonable distribution of the effort around and addressing structural budget deficit between revenue and cost. Self-interested dead shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's four words. Not all of them, not all of them broadcast them on a Saturday morning. It's got a hyphen, we can count it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you all. I think we've, we've solved the world's problems in a, in a very convenient 20 minutes. Outsiders this morning have been writer and social commentator Eva Cox, features director for Elle Australia and... The, the person behind a mysterious new online project, which will shortly be revealed, Alex Gorman, marketing guru and ad man Toby Ralph, author of the recently published Ballots, Bullets and Kabooshit, available in shops <laughs> through Penguin. It's almost five minutes away from ten. First Dog in the Moon's Guide to Modern Living. I am a First Dog on the Moon, Walkley Award winner and a research fellow at the First Dog on the Moon Institute. And doesn't it seem like I'm on the ABC a lot? I do have some difficult news today for you listeners, and I'm going to read from a prepared statement. 
Unfortunately, I have to announce today that at the end of 2017, production of the Guide to Modern Living will cease. Not just in Australia, but everywhere on Earth. We'll be moving production to the moon. We do understand that the closure of the Guide to Modern Living is going to have an enormous impact on the lives of thousands of Australians, even though it is quite a way away. I know it's not today, it's not tomorrow, it's not next month or even next year. And I deeply, deeply regret it. But the important thing is to create the conditions in our economy so I can get another, even better job with less work and more money. It's not easy being a cartoonist, you know. I have to draw pictures for hours, or at least minutes a day. My hands get quite tired, sometimes. This is a difficult time for a lot of people. Yet I think what, uh... This is a difficult time for a lot of people. Yet I think what defines us as Australians, what unites us, is the desire to find someone to blame. Someone we can point the finger at, because we always feel better when it's someone else's fault. There are a number of different factors which have contributed to this decision. Firstly, the carbon tax, obviously, which has made doing anything ever anywhere on this continent completely impossible since it was implemented. Famines, plagues of frogs, hot cross buns in February, the end of life as we know it. Also, the unions are obviously at fault, originally responsible for the 38-hour week, public holidays, sick leave, safe working environments. Now they're responsible for bikies and the end of Western civilization. But you have to admit, it was about time. And of course the government has to take some responsibility as well, in that Tony Abbott was unwilling to come up with the $500 million we needed to keep the Guide to Modern Living in Australia. Yet he'll give literally billions in tax concessions for mining companies who do nothing for the economy other than giving people with big weird heads an opportunity to make complete fools of themselves on the telly. I've had a big <coughs> weird head my whole life, but you don't see me whining about government handouts, and that's because this is the radio. But the real question is why hasn't it happened sooner? How much good money's been thrown after bad? Clearly, someone's on the take. Someone's up to something dodgy, and the only way to find out is to have a royal commission. In fact, we could kill two shamans with one bird by having a whole series of partisan royal commissions designed to embarrass the government's opponents. We could retrain all the thousands of people who work on the Guide to Modern Living mainly in snack preparation, uh, as lawyers and lawyers help us. Imagine a Royal Commission-led economic recovery. So let's get behind this most Australian of solutions. While the government's friends are rolling about in huge vats of taxpayers' money and the government bleats like a lost sock about how the workers are to blame, we can all go back to doing whatever it was we were doing anyway. This has been First Up on the Moon's Guide to Modern Living. I'll be back next week, unless you're listening to this in 2017, in which case I have been murdered by Paul and Hanson. You are welcome. Well, well, well. I have to say that Eva Cox has summed it up. Economically self-interested little dead shits. The 93% of Australians who voted against doing anything serious about global warming. They voted for the Liberal Party, who wants their money to make money to make money for them, without having to pay any tax. They voted for the National Party, who wants to exploit the landscape. Or they voted for the Labor Party, who wants a blue-collar job, working for the Liberal Party or the National Party voters. None of those self-interested groups, economically self-interested little dead shits, are particularly interested in knowing anything which indicates that they're going to have to change their ways, that they're going to have to use less carbon intensive lifestyles. Because their whole game plan is based around the idea of burning more carbon faster to ramp up production so that they can increase their throughput, so that they can lower their prices and make more profit through economies of scale complicated system but if you sell enough of whatever it is you're selling you don't have to make a very large markup in order to finish up with a bloody great big fat profit at the end of it so what you wind up with is the people who statistically numerically are going to run this the direction of the system don't care to listen to anybody who actually knows what is going on or what they're talking about because it's much more attractive to listen to the people 
who can sell a good daydream. So the politicians are listening to the economists and they're not interested in the science. If you listen to the science and you uh, pursue an evidence-based policy, then you have to accept the fact that the economy is going to shrink. And they don't want to know about that. They really don't want to know about that. So therefore, they're going to pursue their economic self-interest, economically self-interested little dead shits, and they're going to damage the environment until the extreme weather events destroy the social and industrial infrastructure that they need in order to have an economy. And sea level rise comes down from the skies, ask them, in Britain. You get flooded out by the rain, making the river rise. And then the waves come in and punch your second story windows out. Anyway, Time will tell if the economists are right. They'll be able to grow their economy to the point where they can establish a colony on Mars and then maybe terraform the moons of Jupiter and it won't matter that Earth's biosphere is dying. Because they'll be somewhere else. After all, when Babylon invented irrigation so they could salinate and then desertify their landscape, the rich bastards didn't stay there and starve. They took their accumulated wealth from fucking up their biosphere and they pissed off somewhere else. Greece, when they cut their trees down, they pissed off somewhere else. Rome, when the Italians had fucked the peninsula, they stole Europe. When the Europeans had buggered Europe, they pinched Africa and India and Australia and the Americas. Eventually, when you live on a ball, a sphere, a globe, you find you can't sell up and go somewhere else because your ancestors have already fucked it there too. Orbals on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.